I didn't even know that this was necessarily an intentional decision or not. But anyways, anthropology has far more females than males. Anyway, <laughs> there are traits that anthropologists have used to determine what people did in the past. One of the first things you do when you're doing skeletal studies is you try to figure out the age and sex of the individuals. Yeah, no kidding. Right? So male, females, like, and actually you do the sex before the age because the sex, sometimes sometimes determining the sex will affect how you age the individual because um, there there's some nuances of differences, how pe males and females age. And also, of course, females uh, mature s faster in the young years, but... Um, and that and that has a, a slight of, um, a, a slight effect on what the age determination is. So you sex and age the skeletal hormones. So um, there's males and females. The sex is binary. <laughs> it's biological. <laughs> All these things You're we've known. You're gonna get in trouble <laughs> for saying that. And so I was asked if, um, from a cultural anthropologist to, um, she's a cultural anthropologist and she also looks at sex differences, has asked to um, be on a panel with her and three other anthropologists. So cultural and, and me and um, I, I think there was one linguist, if I'm not wrong. Um, so five of us all together, all females, that was the panelist, uh, the person who created the panel, Kathleen Lowry. Uh, she's in the University of Alberta. She, that was her decision. It wasn't, you know, I, I didn't even know that this was necessarily an intentional decision or not. But anyways, anthropology has far more females than males anyway. But um, five females from me from the U.S., um, her from Alberta, then um, one from Quebec, one from the UK, and one from Spain. So three languages, four countries, five females, <laughs> and we all had, we all agreed that uh, the panel should be on binary biological sex, but we had different perspectives on other aspects. Right. So, for example, some of them are concerned about. Um, the gap, the sex gap between males and females in technology. I'm not so concerned about that, you know. So, you know, the idea was that the panel's title was um, Let's Talk About Sex, Baby. Um, <laughs> biological sex is still an important analytical variable for anthropology or something like that. Um, and we submitted it. It got accepted to the panel. The American Anthropological Association was the conference. And the other, and they were holding the, the conference as a joint conference with the Canadian Anthropology Society and, they, and what we call the AAA, the American Anthropological Association. And this is, um, so their annual conference, we submitted the panel with a description of the panel and each of our abstracts. So my abstract's title was uh, No Bones About It. Um, skeletons are binary, or uh, people may not be. I think that that's what it was. Um, and hmm. I talk about how anthropologists are very good at determining who is male and female by looking at the bones. I've done this on multiple collections. It's an important aspect to consider. And one of the things is a lot of my research revolved around um, trying to determine what people did in the past. So not, not only, you know, biological differences, but activity differences. And there are traits that anthropologists have used to determine what people did in the past that always show up that the males are more robust or bigger. Like, and we call some of these like muscle markers or entheses. So this is basically where a muscle literally attaches on your bone. And when you use that muscle, it will have, it will create a marker or a ridge on the bone. And the concept is that the more you use that muscle, the bigger the ridges. Mm. 
But there are sex differences in how bone is deposited. And so if you and I were to do the same activity for the same length of time, and then you'd look at our bones, your bone would be more robust than mine, even if we did the exact same thing, because of the hormonal difference is that occur. And so basically, what was happening was, there was this great focus on male activity, and saying, oh, males were doing all this stuff, and ignoring female activity, or, or downplaying it. And so my perspective was like, we have to understand the biological differences, or basically, we're going to be always saying, well, males were doing more than females. Right? Mm. So, um, so that Seems was like, like a progressive like, idea. No? It does. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was for a long time, a progressive <laughs> idea. So, so that was part of my, um, my talk. And then the other part of it was about the importance of understanding sex differences for her for forensics. It's like if you find skeletal remains in a crime setting, an anthropologist will go in there and determine whether it was male and female, if it's skeletal, right? And they learn this by looking at collections, right? You, you're trained in a human osteology class. And this is a basic thing to do, but we've gotten better and better at it. So pretty much... Throughout the whole, the pelvis is the best indicator of sex differences, which is not surprising because of childbirth. Makes sense. Um, but almost the entire skeleton can be used to determine male and female differences. And if you use multiple traits, then you can get a, practically 100%. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at juveniles, because a lot of those sex differences don't come about in, on right. the bones until right. puberty, you can still use DNA. And you can get, be very, very accurate. Um, so in a sense, um, this is you know, obviously it's interesting to look at for past populations, but it's important to look at for forensic reasons, to be able to identify if somebody died, whether they were male or female, to be able to best identify who that person was and then hopefully find the person who did the crime, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? 